Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to this program on Jacob Raymold. It's one of many public programs that we, the Olmsted Network, are sponsoring this year in support of our Olmsted Parks and Landscapes. You can find more on our calendar at olmsted200.org, and I urge you to sign up for all of our upcoming programs. Today, we're pleased to have our good friend and advisory council member, Frank Kowski. Frank is a fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians and a sunny, distinguished professor emeritus, where he taught the history of art and architecture at Buffalo State College. He's an expert on Buffalo Olmsted Parks, and I highly recommend his book, The Best Planned City in the World, Olmsted Vox in the Buffalo Park System. I can also say without exaggeration that Frank is the world's greatest expert on Calvert Vox, but today he's gonna to tell us about another architect who shared work with Frederick Law Olmsted and who is relatively unknown, Jacob Raymold. As it turns out, we can thank Jacob for the beautiful work at the Belvedere Terrace in Central Park. We'll learn this and much more today. I am happy now to turn it over to Frank. Thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about uh, Jacob Raymold and the new book that uh, is just being published by Fordham University Press. And you see on the screen the, the uh, cover. But um, I'm going to start, uh, I think. Why won't the slides change? All right. I can't get it to go here. There we are. Okay. Um, I'll start by uh, sort of introducing uh, Jacob Mould, which many people don't know, especially outside of New York City. Um, here on the screen is the cover of the first serious study of Central Park, the first book to really go into the history of the park. And uh, it was written by someone who knew Olmsted, Vox, and Mould, Clarence Cook, an art critic. And the cover of the book is there on the left. And it has this beautiful monogram, which I assume was designed by Jacob Moll, but I'm not positive. But you'll see that uh, the monogram has Central Park in the center. And then there are three smaller monograms. And they represent the three people who created the park at the very beginning. Of course, we have Frederick Law Olmsted, Calvert Vox, and then this third one over here is Jacob Ray Mould, who's here in the picture, the bottom. And uh, he was even lesser known in his, in his own day, but uh, forgotten thereafter, and sort of his reputation languished, until my dear friend uh, <clears throat> Lucille Gordon came along in the 19, late 70s and early 80s, the last century, and she was a retired uh, person from publishing, and she became a volunteer docent at uh, Central Park with the Central Park Conservancy. And she became fascinated with the work there by Jacob Mould and wanted to find out more about him. And uh, for many years, for several decades, she researched, it was her project to research the life of mold about whom we didn't know very much at all. And she discovered an enormous amount of biographical material and other material. And she had in mind to write a biography. Um, and over the years, we often spoke about her project and whenever something came across my desk that I thought was of interest to her, I sent it along. And um, then uh, she began to suffer from age and had to go into a nursing home. And one of her daughters one day uh, wrote to me and said uh, her mother could no longer carry on her project and she had a great deal of material. Would I like to have it? And I said, well, I would like to, I would take it. I didn't want to see it destroyed because I knew how much work there was involved there. and. Uh, I knew that uh, this was an important contribution to 
the history of landscape architecture and architecture. And I said, well, I didn't have any plans to use it, but if I, I take it and if I never turned it, turned it into anything, I would find someone who would. Well, then the pandemic came along and uh, some other things in my life prevented me from really leaving home. And so here were these boxes of notes that Lucille had uh, amassed. And I decided, well, this is a book that uh, should be written and here it is. It did take some additional research, which I could fortunately do over the internet. And uh, so the result is this book that um, I say is with Lucille Gordon. And in the preface, I make the point that uh, it's not the book she would have written. She was intending to do a biography. This is more of an architectural and art history study of his work, but it could not have been written without her. And uh, there's an enormous amount of, uh, of debt that I owe to her for all of her work and her, and her friendship over the years. Well, here is Mr. Mold. He, in a sense, has a dual life, uh, both he was a British citizen, and then he came to America and spent his career, most of his career, here in the United States in New York City. Um, but he also had a dual career as a designer and a person who was important for music. And so the second part of the title of the book, Sweet on Song, refers to Mould's contributions to the, uh, the music of his day. And this was primarily in the form of translating opera librettos into English from French, German, and Italian. And he started to do this as a young man in he was 19 or 20 when he made his first translation of Der Freischutz, an opera by Weber. And this seems to have been one of his favorite operas for the rest of his life. It was the first of many that he would uh, translate into English, and I'm told by music historians that his trans his librettos are still valid today. He was also a translator of the songs of uh, Jenny Lind, who was the greatest diva of her day, the so-called Swedish Nightingale, and uh, you can see here on the top of this piece of sheet music that was part of her songbook. Uh, his name is very prominently displayed. So uh, throughout his life, he would be important in the history of music. I don't go into that as much as the other part of his career, but it's always there. And it certainly, I think, influenced something of his, his ideas about architecture and art. Well, I'm going to begin his, his biography, as, as uh, Lucille found in little, a little village in uh, Gloucestershire in England, where his uh, grandfather, his great-grandfather, was the minister of a small church in Ebrington. He had two sons, William and Jacob, and the name Jacob Mould has many uses in their family life. So he had two sons, William and Jacob, uh, William became another Anglican minister, but Jacob wanted a more exotic life, and uh, he left home, and he became involved with the infamous Cape Castle in Ghana, which was then known as the Gold Coast, and in fact, he became the governor of the Cape Castle. And this is where many of the slaves that ended up in the British West Indies were, were shipped from here. Um, he had a, a wife who was a half white, half black, uh, and by this woman, Sarah Miles, her name was, he had a son whom he also called Jacob Mould, and J this younger Jacob Mould was sent to England to be educated, and he became a lawyer. And he had a son, Jacob Mould, who is the architect. So the youngest, Jacob Mould, and he often went by the middle name, Jacob Ray Mould, or just Ray Mould, 
and I could never find out why, why that name was so important to him. But anyway, he grew up in London in the 1830s and 40s, at the time that the Houses of Parliament were being built. Uh, he lived not too far away. He must have gone by watching the construction of this impressive Gothic revival building. And um, he eventually, uh, well, I guess I've skipped ahead here a little bit. Uh, Jacob Mould, his father, had married a woman named Mary Ann Oakley. And this is the architect's mother, Mary Ann. In a portrait by a relative of hers, Benjamin or Octavius Oakley, he went by that name, who was an accomplished watercolorist and portraitist in London. But the family was also very important in America. There was a, a branch of the Oakley family in New York that were involved with the wool trade. And this will become a very important part of uh, Jacob Mould's life. Uh, Marianne, from what we know about her, was a very accomplished young romantic woman, in the romantic period. She played the piano, she loved the arts, and she certainly must have passed this along to her son, her only child, uh, Jacob Mould. And probably because of his growing up in a, this artistic family, instead of following the law as his father had done, Jacob decided to go into architecture. He studied at the new King's College in London. And then he became an apprentice to this very extraordinary person, Owen Jones. And Owen Jones is right up there with John Ruskin and uh, the other great romantics of his time. He was fascinated by ornament and by ornament from all kinds of cultures. He began, began his career by spending several years in Spain studying the Alhambra, the Moorish palace there in Granada. And he published a very famous book about Granada about uh, the uh, Alhambra, which you see here on the screen. He even invented a method of color printing so that he could reproduce some of the rich colors that were in the, in the building. He later became even more famous for a book called The Grammar of Ornament, and that's in the lower part of the slide here, in which he cataloged ornaments from all over the world, and uh, this will be an important influence on his pupil, his apprentice, uh, Jacob Mould. In fact, Mould, Jacob Mould certainly helped in the printing of the Alhambra. Uh, we know that he was in Owen Jones' studio at the time. Owen Jones also was the man who des developed uh, color theory in architecture, and he was and a group of people that we call today uh, architects of polychromy, the introduction of color into architecture, which was something rather revolutionary at the time in, in England. And he was not only interested in the architecture of uh, medieval Spain and the medieval cultures, but especially of Italy and um, he certainly traveled there and passed along this love for the very rich and colorful Italian Gothic architecture to his pupil, to uh, Jacob Mould. And in fact, this was one of the books that, that was published that uh, Owen Jones printed while uh, he had uh, Jacob Mould as his apprentice. Well. Owen Jones recognized that uh, even though he was a great theorist and he, he didn't design that many buildings, his pupil, Jacob Mould, needed to get some practical experience. And so he passed him along to a very important architect in London at the time, William May, his name was. And he was designing the largest house in London 
for a very wealthy man, Dorchester House, and Jacob Mould became his sort of clerk of the works and primary assistant on this great massive mansion that uh, no longer stands, but it was the, the premier building in London for private residents at the time in the 1840s. Well, so Jacob Mould was kind of set here to become a member of the British architectural profession. He was trained with two great names in the field. But then something happened to him, <laughs> something uh, he, he would regret for the rest of his life. I said that he was interested in music and opera, and he would often go to the opera in London. And one day he met a young woman there, her name was Emily, and he fell in love. And shortly, just a few months later, uh, they were married, but it turned very bad very soon. Um, one day, shortly after the, uh, the wedding, Emily's sister arrived at the door to their house and knocked on the door, uh, Jacob Mould answered, and she was there with a little two-year-old girl in tow, and she introduced Jacob to his daughter, or his wife's daughter. He'd known nothing about this uh, before the marriage. And uh, at the time, he could not get a divorce because the only grounds for divorce in England were for adultery, but she hadn't committed adultery because this child was already uh, two years old and probably illegitimate, but he was, he was kind of stuck. And then Emily revealed that she also had a, a nasty side to her character. She became violent and could be very abusive even in, in public. And probably as a result of some of her outbursts, he lost his job with uh, William A. on this great uh, mansion. And he was in a, in a bind. So he and his mother decided that uh, they would flee. They would leave London and moved to New York, where she had relatives who were pretty substantial citizens in New York City, and would indeed help them to get started and help them to start a new life. And he thought he was just leaving his troubles behind. Um, he told Owen Jones, with whom he stayed a, a st strong friend, that he was leaving. And Owen Jones tried to dissuade him. He said, this is, this is a big mistake as far as your career is concerned. And as he said, uh, the Americans will wring you out like a wet rag and then drop you like a hot potato. Sort of a strange construction. But anyway, uh, he, he thought that uh, America was not a place for Jacob Mould and for a British architect. But anyway, he came along. And the New York City at the time was booming. It was a very important, becoming the most important commercial and cultural city in America. Uh, architecturally, this was a, a, a city that was mainly, so we could say, brownstone. And um, Jacob Mould, with the help of his his relatives, the Oakley relatives, started to try and build a career as an architect here in, in America, in New York. And uh, in 1853, this he came over in 1852. In 1853, he attracted the attention of a congregational, a Unitarian minister, and Henry Bellows, who was his name, was a very well-known preacher in New York City. He wanted to build a new church that would call attention to his important, the importance of his congregation. And he bought a very prominent site near Gramercy Park in New York. And he hired Mold to build this church. And this was called All Souls Unitarian Church. And it was a revelation for American architecture. It introduced the Italian colorful patterning of architecture uh, in high Victorian Gothic design. 
and revolutionized American architecture at the time. And unfortunately, it did not survive beyond the 1930s, but it was its destruction was one of the great losses in, in modern American architecture. Well, that the church did put Mold's name above to, in front of the public. And a few years later, uh, when the competition was announced for Central Park, Olmsted and Vox, and Vox probably knew him from London because Vox had come over a few years before. Um, they tried to in, invite him to come and help them prepare the Green Sward plan. This is not the Green Sward plan, but they would work at uh, Vox's house at night. And Molds said, No, I, it's a beautiful plan. It's wonderful. It'll be probably the best. But I'm sure you won't win because the competition will be decided on political grounds. But then when he learned that they did win, he decided that, well, yes, maybe I will come along and help. And so this begins his career with, uh, in 1858-59, with working at Central Park, which will carry him through for almost two decades. Well, what does he do in Central Park? Well, he doesn't design the landscape. He doesn't really design most of the buildings, but he adds the element of delight to Calvert Vox's structures, and especially the Bethesda Terrace, which is the richest piece of architecture and sculpture in 19th century America. And here is the view that was published of the terrace. Now, the terrace is the transitional point between the, the more formal area up here of the mall, and then as you come down these big staircases into a, a basin, a fountain basin, and then to the lake and out into the park, which is the more natural part. So it's a transition. And uh, it was meant to be a place where people could congregate. This was an important part of the program. For Central Park. And so to enhance this experience of congregating, being in nature, uh, mold adds all sorts of beautiful ornament. Now, this is the 19th century, and so this architecture needs to be decorated, needs to be ornamented, needs to have the element of delight added to it. So here is the main element of the uh, the, the, what is they call the Bethesda Terrace, these two great staircases that lead down from the upper level of the park down to the, to the level of the lake. And on these pillars and on the banisters and everywhere, there are these beautiful carved designs that were the invention of Jacob Mould. Here's one of the few photographs we have of him. He's standing next to one of the pillars at the base of the uh, staircase, and he's displaying as if to display his, his uh, work, his creation here. He didn't carve these. He made the designs, and others carved them. But I like this picture, too, because I say it's one of the few photographs we have of him. But we do know from uh, people's testimony that he was also something of a dandy, and he loved expensive clothes. In fact, he got into trouble a few times and even went bankrupt for not paying his, his bills. But here he is standing there uh, in obviously very fancy suit and long coat. And um, the closest we can get to a portrait is getting trying to see this face blown up over here. We really only have that one woodcut that I showed at the beginning that shows what he looked like. Well, in addition to the decorating the pillars, there are, there are elements throughout the, the terrace that have to do with the theme of nature and uh, the out of doors. And here are some of the beautiful little uh, vignettes that he designed for pillars and parts of the, uh, the outside of the, of the Bethesda Terrace. Uh, the knowledge, this is supposed to represent the autumn seasons. And these others are also having to do with the rooster, dawn, and the evening with the owl. And these are based on 
the kinds of carvings you might find on a medieval cathedral in, the, in these uh, gothic little uh, trefoil designs are all highly inventive and very, very beautiful. Uh, in this wonderful photograph by Sarah Cedar Miller, who did some of the pictures in the book, um, you can see how rich and decorated this, uh, this construction is. And indeed, I think the best are these big panels that he designed that have this theory, the theme of the seasons as you come down the staircase. And here's one that's close up. And I think these were actually inspired by a passage in, uh, in Darwin's book, The uh, Origin of the Species, which was new at the time. And uh, I just read you a little section of that description. When you look at these teeming images of nature, I think they really must have been inspired by, by Darwin. And he wrote, uh, an entangled bank clothed with many, many plants of many kinds, with birds singing in the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. These elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. So I think uh, Mould is trying to evoke this idea of evolution and the interaction of nature and different species of nature and plants. And it's really a very powerful uh, image. And there are four of these. They represent different seasons of the year. And then when you go down below the, the staircases, underneath the terrace is this beautiful room called the Arcade. And this is indeed Mould's masterpiece of color. Here he invented designs that were to be carried out in tile rather than uh, carving and to be richly, uh, uh, color, richly colorful so that as you come down into this lower space, there is this sense of almost like being in the Alhambra. And some of the designs were certainly inspired by what he knew of that building. And the classic, the most extraordinary thing is the ceiling, which is made of tiles that are suspended above you and great, uh, it's extremely heavy. And he invented a system by which this could be done. And apparently the, only, the first time that this was accomplished. The, um, the, the Central Park Conservancy restored this area in the 19, uh, 80s, and now it's it's again as it was in Mould's time, and we are lucky to have a great deal of drawings that Mould made for the the arcade and for other parts of the the terrace and other parts of the park that are preserved in the municipal archives in, uh, in New York City, and in fact. He was where, very well known for the beauty of his drawings. Sometimes he exhibited them alone at the National Academy of Design. Here are some designs that were for little medallions in mosaic in different colored uh, ceramics. Well, most people that go to uh, the, the Bethesda Terrace think of it as the place of the angel the great angel of waters, as it's officially known right here, which was a later addition to the basin that was there. And this was designed by Emma Stebbins, one of our first uh, women sculptors. And it was installed in 18, 1872, and it represents the biblical angel who stirs the water at the Bethesda pool and cures the sick. Well, the angel is hers, but the basin, this beautiful basin of water below it, is Mould's contribution to the, the statue. And it certainly is also based on some of the Moorish or uh, things that were uh, fountains that were at the Alhambra. And indeed, Mould will become well known as a designer of fountains. Well, music. Uh, 
Vermold, the park needed some animation, and he is the person who sponsored the first musical concerts in Central Park. Uh, they took place at, in the Ramble in the beginning in 1859, but that was not a suitable location. And by 1863, uh, the park had built this wonderful bandstand that Mould had designed. And every summer, there were concerts in the park, and many times they were, the program was chosen by Mould and paid for by money he would raise for the band that was played, that played there. Harvey Dodworth was very well known as a conductor for many, many years at the afternoon concerts in Central Park. He also went on to design some very delightful little accessories to the park, all kinds of things, none of which are there anymore. These are drinking fountains. Uh, it's a very elaborate, it's a very elaborate provi provision from, made in the summer for water to be chilled over ice and people could come and take a drink of water. And the one on the left, there were these little cups on the chains, you couldn't walk away with the cup. And this one here that covered the, the, uh, the basin there. And so there were these scattered throughout the park as again, something that added comfort and delight to your experience. Birds too were very important <laughs> to uh, Olmsted and Vaux in the park. And uh, Jacob Mould designed some of these extraordinary bird cages uh, that were there. This one on the left uh, was near the was in the Bethesda Terrace. Very elaborate kind of uh, metal bird cage for a more exotic creature. And the one on the right was uh, a rustic design for a sparrow house. The sparrows were new to uh, America. They'd been brought to, from England and everybody thought these were quite an, uh, an attraction here. And so there was a special home houses made to keep them in the park. He also designed a lot of the ornament that decorated the, the many bridges that were in the park as to uh, carry people on carriages and pedestrian walks through the park. The most famous probably is the Bow Bridge that Fox uh, designed, but the railing is this beautiful pattern of circles that was invented by mold, as well as the flower pots that were on the, there on the side. Um, a little while later, uh, just outside the park, he built uh, in metal. He was also very interested in new materials. He used this metal for um, a pavilion for people waiting for the streetcars that brought them to the park. This was originally outside on 59th Street, and now it's been brought into the park and rechristened the Ladies' Pavilion. And it's a very, it's a piece of our, almost Art Nouveau uh, metal construction. His own contribution to the park as a building was uh, built as a sheepfold. Uh, for a brief period, Mold was the architect in chief of the park. He had, uh, replaced Olmsted and Vaux in 1871-72. And during that time, he added some things that had not been part of the original plan. And one was the sheepfold to keep the sheep at night that would graze on the meadow. And so that's long been the uh, restaurant, the tavern on the green, but you can see his love for colorful materials in architecture. Fountains. Uh, he also was, became the architect of the Department of Public Parks. And in addition to Central Park, he designed features for other parts of the city. This is the beautiful fountain that's in front of City Hall. And it was put there in 18, the 1870s by Moll's design. In his own life outside of the park, he designed a number of important buildings, uh, houses. This is, uh, the house that no longer stands for the painter Albert Bierstadt, who had popularized images of the West. And uh, he had his, a large house in Terrytown, New York, that Mould had designed. He designed a house in Buffalo for a very famous, a very wealthy uh, 
railroad executive. It also no longer uh, stands. And he <laughs> designed a railway car for the Pasha of Egypt in 1859. It was built in America. He designed the, the decorations and then it was shipped to Egypt and it was used by the, the Ottoman Viceroy to travel on the new railroads that he had built in Egypt. But most of his career was associated with the park and for 16 or 17 years, he was the architect who worked with Vaux and Olmsted to realize the plans of the park. Here's the beautiful Belvedere that Vaux designed and Mold added this wonderful porch that's been recently reconstructed. However, in 1874, after a Great Recession had hit the country in 1873, Mold was uh, let go from the park. And um, here he is standing on the recently completed Willowdale Arch. And we think this is, this is Mold here with Olmsted here and Calvert Vox here to his, to his side. Well, but for reasons of the economy, they had to, to cut back and mold was the victim of this recession and this cutback. He was celebrated in the press. People complained that uh, this, was a, this was false economy. This man had been there for all this time and he worked so hard and he was such a valuable asset to the park, but uh, it, it really didn't carry any weight and he was out and he faced a very difficult time in his life because this was his employment and also there was a depression on, so it wasn't likely that he could get much work as an architect. But he was saved by someone reading the newspapers about his dismissal, a man named Henry Miggs, who was down in Lima, Peru, where he'd gone to construct the great the Andean Railway across the Andes to link the Pacific to the Atlantic. He's known popularly as the Yankee Pizarro. He read about Mold's troubles and uh, Mike's had in mind that he wanted to make Lima the Paris of South America. And here was this man he's, he read about, he didn't know him, but he'd had a great reputation as a designer and architect. And he invited him to come to Lima and take charge of the project that he had to make Lima a cosmopolitan city. So for about four years from 1875, Mold leaves New York. He's about 50 years old now, and he moves to Lima. And the first day he gets there, second day, uh, Henry Mikes takes him on a railroad venture into the Andes on this extraordinary railroad he's built. And the first night they stay overnight somewhere in the mountains and they have an earthquake. <laughs> and Mole doesn't know whether he wants to stay in Peru or not, but he does. And he's very happy actually, because Henry Mides lavishes all sorts of uh, money and resources on him. And he, he's, he will stay there for four years. And some of the works he, he did are still there. The, uh, this is the largest house that he designed for uh, a banker and his wife, the Casa Dubois. It's the first, it's reputed to be the first stone building in Lima. And um, here on the right is a view inside is a, a patio that you come into as the entrance and some of these beautiful tiles that Mold designed and that certainly, you know, are reminiscent of what he'd done in Central Park at the terrace. But his biggest project was to create a park and a boulevard to link the city of Lima, which is more or less here, with seven miles away to the ocean, to the harbor down here. And this is one of the few plans that survive uh, for this, cons this, this plan. There was to be a long boulevard, straight boulevard here, lined with mansions. And then what seems to be a rather naturalistic park along the river that would um, link the city to the ocean. Um, now, unfortunately, this was never 
never came to reality because Henry Miggs died suddenly just two years after Mold had arrived in Lima. And so he, he stayed only for, he, he stayed on for another two years and then he went back to New York. He couldn't stay there any longer. His patron was gone. Situation had changed. Mold comes back in 1879. He finds that the American architectural scene has changed. His type of architecture is no longer popular. Um, he regains his position with the Department of Public Parks, and he does a few extra additions to Central Park and to some other parks. But his greatest, latest work is his contributions to a park in the northern part of Manhattan, Morningside Park, which had been started in the 1870s. Olmsted and Vox had made a plan for this long, narrow piece of land that had a very unusual topography. And the, the, the land was like a valley in the lower part with a cliff along the western upper ridge. So it's a land that could never be really developed into the grid of streets. You can see how they end here because this is virtually a cliff along here. Well, the park languished. Uh, it was created in the 1870s and Olmsted and Vaux had made a plan, but nothing ever uh, was carried out. In 1880, Mold is now working again for the Department of Public Parks, and he is hired to create this boulevard along the upper ridge of the park called Morningside Avenue or Morningside Boulevard. And this involves a huge construction of staircases and ramparts to lead from the park itself, the lower park, up to the, the avenue, up to the, the street level up here. And he takes the opportunity now to create not just a street, but a, a place where one could observe the view from all along here with big um, sort of ramparts that come out into the park where we're viewing, they were created for viewing balconies. And he had in mind a couple of places in Europe that had recently done this. He writes about this. Uh, one was the uh, Butte at the Montmartre, which had recently been made accessible through staircases and, ramp and ramps. And people could now climb the hill and have his, the pleasure of looking back at the city. The other was in Florence, across the river, across the Arno, where the hilltop became the Piazzale Michelangelo. It's still one of the most popular spots for people to go to get a full view of the, of the Renaissance city of Florence. So he wanted this kind of pleasure of observing the city, observing the landscape from a high point of view, that you could climb a staircase to be in New York. And in fact, that's what came, came to be and is still there. Um, the park was then later on in the 1880s finished by Olmsted and Vaux, but they kept his beautiful and very powerful uh, ramparts here, which now project out into the landscape with places for viewing the city and, in, and even beyond the city that said you could see Long Island Sound from there. So this is a new kind of urban pleasure in addition to what the, the Central Park had provided earlier on. Well, he doesn't live long enough to see that project completed. He dies in 1886. Uh, apparently he was never in very good health anyway. He died at home from heart failure and he was buried in the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Here's his marker in the Oakley family plot. These people had stuck with him all through life, and uh, he's buried there in their family plot. And this little picture was taken a number of years ago by 
Danny Callaghan, who was in charge of restoring the tile work at the Bethesda Terrace, and who very touchingly put this little tile next to Jacob Mole to remind us of his contributions. So thank you very much. I hope I've given you a little bit about uh, Jacob Mould that might whet your appetite to learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. We do have a few questions from the chat box. And if anyone has any burning questions still, I would encourage you to submit them via the chat or drop them into the Q&A function. Um, but we'll just start in the order that we've received them. Um, I do want to say, Frank, you did get a lovely comment. Um, the images that you showed were amazing. I think everybody everybody can agree it, it did a lot for the presentation. Um, the first question is, did Mold ever actually visit Alhambra? We don't know. Um, there's no evidence that he did. But it's... He, uh, Owen Jones traveled a lot to the continent, even after he'd done his major research on the Alhambra. So it's not unlikely that he went there, but uh, there's no record to prove that he did. And our friend Pamela Bremen asked, did his collaboration with Olmsted and Vox continue beyond Central Park? Now, I know you mentioned Morningside Park, but are there other examples? Um, well, he, there's the, the largest collection of letters or correspondence that exists that, with, from Mold is in the Olmsted papers. And he writes often uh, to Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, and in one instance, he's sort of begging for a job uh, to work with him. And I, I think he had in mind the uh, grounds of, his, of the U.S. Capitol, where there were these walls were going to be built. But Olmsted already had someone else in mind, another English uh, architect had come over a little bit earlier. And uh, I don't know, no, I don't think he did much else with uh, Vox and, and, and Olmsted. And I have a feeling there's some personal things about mold that sort of put people off and uh, he, he never achieved the kind of reputation that he really deserved. And I think uh, in some of the work that he lost because of, um, you can read in the book, some of the, the personal problems that he had. So I, no, it wasn't, he didn't work with them uh, because uh, there was either Thomas Wisedell who came later or Frederick Withers who was the architect associate with um, Vox and Olmsted. Perfect. Um, do you have any information about the Paleozoic Museum that Mould designed for Central Park? Did he make any comments about its destruction? <laughs> well, um, there were two things. There, there, in the arsenal itself, there was a museum of uh, animals and, and uh, dinosaurs, but he'd also built, during the period of 1871-72, when Olmsted and Vox were away from the park, Mould became architect in chief, and this was during the Tweed administration, um, and they, they put him in charge, and they gave him a big budget, and he made plans for a number of things, and also for uh, a menagerie building, and um, when Olmsted and Vox came back onto the park after, after that, they promptly had it removed because it was in a place they thought was destructive to the landscape. And I have to say that Jacob Mould was not a landscape architect. And I, I think his interest in the park was far less in the, the beauty of the landscape, the pastoral theory, the philosophy of the democratization that drove Olmsted and Vox. He was just, he, he was primarily interested in decorating it and making it uh, more beautiful in the sense of an architectural contribution to the park. So um, I, I think that that's really where his heart lay, not, not so much in the landscape itself. 
What was your biggest surprise in researching his life and his life's work? The, the greatest surprise? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, well, I guess there are several surprises. First of all, how much he contributed to the music of his day. Uh, every I didn't know that much about that, but he really was significant in um, librettos and sponsoring the first music in Central Park, and just in general in the music scene in late 19th century uh, New York. Uh, the other was to find out uh, what he'd done in Lima, Peru. Now, I did not go to Lima, but uh, I there were people there that helped me out, and uh, that's quite a chapter in and of itself. There's probably something, a lot more to be learned about his days down in, um, in Lima. And also his early life. Uh, that's another thing that was surprising. And this was largely the results of Lucille's uh, work about the, his ancestors and the fact that he probably did have black blood in his background because his grandfather had married a woman who was by the terms of the day, a mulatto. And, um, and so he probably, in, in the uh, theories of the time, if you had one drop of black blood, you were considered black. And he would have been, I think they termed it a hexa, hexa quadruple, uh, one sixteenth part. Um, so, he may have been one of those people who uh, we use the term today, passing in his time. And now at the time of his death, his death certificate says white, but um, it's pretty sure that, that uh, he did have black ancestry. So those were surprises. Yeah, that's interesting. Um... Our friend Brad Taylor from Morningside Park asked, I read somewhere that he got fired from NYC Parks while working on Morningside. Is there any truth to that? Well, yes. In the last few years of his life, once he came back from uh, Peru, he was off again, on again, employed with the Department of Public Parks. So there were times when he was, he was off. In fact, he even undertook to sue them department for back wages when he was let go at one point so but primarily those designs were were his work oh frank sorry i think you're Muted. Huh. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. I didn't see it, but uh, um, the, the primarily the work, the the uh, ramparts, the work in in Morningside Park. Even though he was fired sometimes and rehired, they're really his work. Perfect. Um, Rosanna asks, well. Um, we can share, um, for sure, share the PowerPoint and some of these images afterward. Um, Frank, if you're okay with that, uh, I think our audience is, is interested. I can uh, <laughs> perfect. Um, and then Kathleen asks how you picked the title of your book, which I'm, I'm wondering as well. Oh, yes, I should have, I, I didn't get to say that. Um, these, Hell on Color was Mold's own expression. He said at one point when he designed All Souls Church, <clears throat> the one that got the nickname the Church of the Holy Zebra because it was red and white striped materials, he said, I'm hell on color. And that was his great contribution to American architecture, bringing the polychrome tradition to America from England. Um, so that was a reference to him. Now, I had a I had a friend who was a librarian and kind of joked, I said, they're going to catalog this book with religious studies, but uh, it's really that because of his architecture. And the other, other part of the title, Sweet On Song, is because of his great uh, work with music. I think we have time for one more question. 
Um, was his life or career impacted by the Civil War? Was it impacted by the Civil War? Uh, well, yes, yes, uh, not, not directly. Of course, Olmsted goes off to be with the Sanitary Commission, uh, but Vox and uh, Mould stay on at Central Park. Um, Great. Uh, I, I, I think maybe his family, the Oakley family, was impacted maybe also by the war. They were wool merchants, and the demand for wool went way up during the war for the Union troops, of course. So I don't, but not, uh, he didn't get any commissions that would be connected with, with, the, with the war, if that's what you mean. Well, Frank, thank you so much. I know um, we've just been flooded with comments. Everyone has deeply enjoyed this presentation um, and I have as well. We are going to link um, the purchase link for your book in the chat box below. And um, if you've signed up for this webinar, we'll be sure to, to follow up with you um, and, and share that link as well. Um, Frank, do you have anything else you'd like to share before we we close out here? No, I would just uh, again thank my dear friend Lucille Gordon, who died in November 2021, for all of her efforts. For her. she's the one who really resurrected his his reputation. Wonderful. Well, thank you, and thank you all for joining us. We hope you'll check our calendar at olmstead200.org. We are having two more programs at the end of April to celebrate Olmstead's 201st birthday, um, a panel on climate change and also a panel on Frederick Law Olmstead Designing America. Um, and we hope to see you there. Thanks to, to everyone. <laughs>